For 10 years, I worked during the summers with the city of Vancouver. And one of the jobs that I had during the summer as a way for, to pay my way through school, both through my undergrad and graduate degrees, is to work on the trucks that help to care for many of the large trees throughout the city, doing pruning work and even some chipping, among other things. It was work that I deeply enjoyed and work where I found a lot of purpose. For me, this work was an opportunity to help our city look more beautiful. And again, we live in a really beautiful city. It's also an opportunity to care for many of those living things, those living trees throughout the city. And even though I enjoyed and found a lot of purpose in my work, not everybody who I work with felt and found the same thing. I remember being uh, my first week on one of the pruning trucks. It was myself and another new person. We were also happened to be the youngest people on the truck. And it was uh, first day we were having a, a coffee break together. And the timer went off, indicating coffee break was over, time to get back to work. And uh, the other newbie and myself jumped up, threw our jacket on, booked it outside, and got back to work as quickly as we could. About five minutes goes by, and we look back, and no one else has left the truck. We are the only ones outside of it. Someone's still finishing their Sudoku puzzle, someone's working on a crossword, and one guy is nursing the last few sips of his coffee. And this happened every day of the first week. And I was wondering, what's going on here? Is it just youthful enthusiasm that's going on? This first week also happened to be extremely cold and rainy, which uh, if you live here in Vancouver, does sometimes happen here in the early summer, cold and rainy. And so maybe being a little bit older, they just needed to rest, or just having been through the grind of it for so long, we're just taking their time. But over time, I realized actually something else was going on. They actually saw their work differently. I saw this both through my conversations with them, but also on Friday afternoons. On Friday afternoons, this team, who generally pretty laid back and disengaged in their work, had an extra jump in their step as they began to share about their weekend plans and their Friday night plans. Or for some of the older guys on the crew, they were one weekend closer to retirement, the great weekend. <laughs> for them, work was something to be endured for the sake of the weekend. According to studies, this is actually a majority view among people globally, that work is felt to be purposeless and disengaging. Gallup Research and Consulting Institute did a study across 142 countries. And among the people who they interviewed, they found that only 13% of people felt engaged in their work. It's a pretty low number. Two leading consultants around the area of work said this around work today. They said, work today is a depleting, dispiriting experience, and for some, it's getting even worse. Maybe you feel that too. As this perspective isn't outside the church, it's also inside the church too. I remember having a conversation with a group of Christian medical dental uh, students and residents. And at one point we were talking about spiritual formation and I asked them, how do you see the integration between your work and your faith? And a couple of them looked at me like they'd never thought about it in their whole life. That it seemed for them that Work was something you do Monday to Friday over in this place, and faith was something you did on Sundays or in set dedicated spaces like prayer, scripture, or a small group that you did over here. That faith and work lived and existed in two different places. The Christian businessman William Deal wrote this. If people cannot find any spiritual meaning in their work, they are condemned to living a certain dual life not connecting what they do on a Sunday morning with what they do the rest of the week. On the other hand, a spirituality that connects our work and faith will say, your work is your prayer. What if we and our work were made for more? What if our work wasn't just something to be endured for the sake of the weekend or retirement, but what if our work was filled with purpose? What if our work, as William Deal suggests, is a kind of prayer. We're in a sermon series here at 10th called Rhythms for Life. 
And we've been looking at different aspects of our rhythm for life or our rule of life that support our relationship with God. Things that we can find in Ken's book, God on My Everything, but we've also been exploring here for the last three weeks. Different aspects like prayer and friendship and Sabbath. These parts of our rhythm of our life, our spiritual rhythm of life, spiritual rule of life, help to hold up our relationship with God. The same way that a trellis holds up a grapevine, allowing it to experience more of God's, or sorry, the way a trellis holds up a grapevine, allowing it to experience more of the sun's warmth and light, so too a spiritual rhythm for life or rule of life holds up our relationship with God, creating space and time for us to experience more of God's grace and light and love. And today we're going to look at one aspect, namely work as a part of our rhythm for life, something that helps sustain our relationship with God, a, a place where, as William Deal says, is like a prayer, that our work is a kind of prayer in that through our work, we communicate God's character to the world, and our work is also a place where we meet with God. Our central passage for today is from Genesis 2.15. So if you have your Bibles, a Bible app, you can open those up now. You can also follow along on the screen behind me. And we're going to do a little bit of a theology of worship today from Genesis 1 through 3. So you're going to see me go back and forth between Genesis 1, 2, and 3, looking at what God has designed our work for, and also how is work a part of our rhythm for life that sustains our relationship with him. So let's begin in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to care for it. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you have created us and our work for more. That our work is not simply something to be endured, but has great purpose, can bring happiness, and is a part of our relationship with you, that you meet us in our work. And so whatever our work is, whether our work is paid or unpaid, volunteer, whether we work in an office or whether we work at home, whether we work with clients and patients or whether we work with children or even if our work involves aging parents, I pray this time would be an opportunity to more deeply integrate our work life and our faith life and to see our work as a kind of prayer. Amen. Leading up to our passage, so leading up to Genesis 2.15, the emphasis had so far been on God and God's work, hadn't it? God is the one who creates and who orders and who does good work. God creates the heavens and the earth and he orders them. God creates the sky, the land, and the sea, and he orders them. God creates the sun and moon and orders our day, orders time. God creates light and even brings order to light and darkness. God even creates the flora and the fauna and brings order. And a part of God's good work, because everything we're told is good that God creates, part of God's good work is that God creates humanity. And God creates humanity with a specific purpose in mind, that we're told humanity is created in the image of God. See this in Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind, or humanity, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we're told that humanity is created in the image of God. Now, you think of the word image, what do you think of? Maybe you think of a picture of something, or maybe you think of a mirror, something that shows our own image when we look into it, Right? An image reflects something into the world. So a mirror reflects our physical appearance back to us. Now, when we're told that humanity is made in the image of God and therefore is an image which images and reflects God, what parts of God are we intended to reflect? What parts of God are we intended to image? Well, it's not his physical appearance. But according to Bruce Waltke, who I had an opportunity to learn from at Regent, who is 
I think the leading expert in the book of Genesis and the Old Testament. He says, humanity being created in the image of God is about reflecting God's character into the world. And so we are created to reflect God's character into the world. And so let's stop to just follow a little bit of the logic of Genesis 1 and 2 and leading into Genesis 3. God works. God rests too on the seventh day, but God works, bringing life and light and ordering to all of creation, and he does good work. God creates humanity who is made in his image who reflect his character. And then humanity is placed in the garden where they are invited to work, to live out and to practice being an image of God, reflecting God's character into the world. That according to the Genesis narrative, humanity's work in the garden is a space where they practice reflecting God's character into the world. That work was intended to be a burden, work was intended to be a gift, intended to be purposeful, intended to be a place where we reflect God's character into the world. And so if prayer is a way of communication between us and God, a way that we communicate ourselves to God, and a way God communicates to us, in a way our work is a kind of prayer in that God is communicating his character to the world in and through ourselves. Our work is a kind of prayer. Through our work, we're communicating God's character and who he is to others. Rick Smith is a part of our Mount Pleasant morning community, usually attends our nine o'clock service. He was here this morning. And I had an opportunity to work with Rick when I worked at Regent College. When I was a student at Regent doing my master's degree in theology, I worked both as a TA in theology, but I also worked as a custodian. And Rick was my boss. And Rick was one of the most joyful, engaged people I'd ever met in my entire life regarding his work. So he was a custodian, and he was a team lead for the other custodians. And so I reached out to him in advance for this message and said, Rick, what helped you to be sustained in your joy and your engagement in the workplace as a custodian and working with others? You know, People like me aren't always easy to deal with, so how do you find so much joy and excitement in your work? And here's what he said. God has called us to be Christ-like. He is a God of care, compassion, and love. These are, of course, only a small part of his character. I believe in whatever we do, we are called to show these. This may be through walking alongside students or coworkers, listening or laughing with them, and sometimes even feeling their pain. I recall a student who, by chance, I met again very recently who said, I so appreciated my time at Regent, and you were an important part of that. I arrived from a foreign country feeling kind of lost and out of place, but your attitude and approach to what you did helped, and you made me feel welcomed and cared for and more ready to continue my journey. And then Rick continued in his own words. Our ministry and service to God, I believe, can be in whatever we do, whether it be in direct ministry or in any other way of service to the kingdom. A part of what sustained Rick's joy and engagement in his work is that he saw his work as an opportunity to reflect God's character into the world. Whether he was doing direct custodial work or working with a team, he highlighted God's care, compassion, and love, qualities of God's character, which he sought to reflect in all that he did. And in highlighting that story, it shows that, in fact, other people receive that just as I did. Whatever our work is, whether we work as a custodian, an accountant, a medical professional, a stay-at-home parent, or even if we're caring for elderly parents or engaged in some other volunteer work, our work is an opportunity to reflect God's character into the world. A number of months ago, our executive pastor, David Sason, gave a talk to our staff called Accounting is Sacred. And during the talk, he introduced us to a man named Luca Pacioli. Luca was a mathematician and Franciscan friar who lived in the 15th to 16th centuries. 
He was a brilliant man and good friends with Leonardo da Vinci. Luca Pacioli today is known as the father of modern accounting and bookkeeping because he developed something called the double entry system for bookkeeping. Are any of you accountants here? Maybe you've heard of the double entry system of bookkeeping before. I know at some of our earlier services that was definitely the case. It's okay, if you're an accountant, you can raise your hand right now. <laughs> There's no shame as I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> but Luca was known as the father of modern accounting and bookkeeping, and the changes that he made were not primarily mathematical in nature, the biggest changes that had the greatest impact, but were theological in nature. That for Luca, the changes that he brought were because he wanted to reflect a certain part of God's character in and through his work. And that part of God's character is that God is truth. And accounting is the science of telling God's truth with numbers. And bookkeeping is the science of telling God's truth with numbers. And Luca wanted accounting and bookkeeping to be a practice of reflecting God's truth in and through the world. Accounting is sacred. Whatever work you do is an opportunity to reflect God's goodness and love and character in and to the world and into others. What work do you do? Paid or unpaid, what work do you do? And in what ways can you reflect God's character in and to the world? If you're a therapist, a counselor, or maybe you work with teams of people. You can reflect that God is a shepherd, that he cares for them individually and loves them, even through some of the most difficult seasons of their life. If you're an accountant or a bookkeeper, that God is truth. And by doing accounting, you participate in God's truth-telling in the world. Or maybe you're a medical professional and you participate in the reality that God is a healer. Whatever work you do, paid or unpaid at home, in the office, or volunteer, our work is invited to be a place where we reflect God's character into the world. I think we should stop for a moment and acknowledge the reality that work is also really hard, isn't it? I have never met a person who told me that they have an easy job. Whether your work is doing accounting, bookkeeping, whether you're a stay-at-home parent, you're caring for elderly parents, or you're a consultant, whatever you do, likely there will be spaces, often regular spaces, where you feel the reality that work is really hard. And that's even reflected in the Genesis narrative, in that after the fall, our work changes. And we feel that reality every day, don't we? But finding greater purpose in our work doesn't necessarily take away the reality that work is difficult, but it can bring greater engagement and even happiness into our work. In 2019, Forbes magazine wrote an article, and in that article, they said that purpose is more effective than pay in boosting happiness in a workplace. So pay attention to this. If you are both an employee or an employer, if you want to boost happiness in the workplace, increase purpose. Don't first and foremost increase pay, although some of your employees will probably say definitely boost the pay. <laughs> but the most effective way to boost happiness in the workplace is actually increasing purpose. And so when we see our work as deeply purposeful, as helping to communicate God's character, reflecting God's character in and into the world, we not only find deeper integration between our faith and our work lives, but we, in fact, become happier, more engaged people at the work that we do. Our work is a kind of prayer because in and through our work, we communicate God's character to the world. We reflect God's character to the world. Our work is also a prayer in that God meets us in our work. And we, again, see this in the Genesis narrative. In Genesis 3, verse 8, we're told, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day. So the garden is the workplace for Adam and Eve, and they hear God walking and moving in the place of their work. 
Now, even though this is the only time that we read in the Genesis narrative where God is walking in the garden explicitly, a large number of biblical scholars believe that God was actually in the regular practice of walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, meeting them there in the place of their work. This is showing us that our workplace and our relationship with God were not intended to be two separate spaces, but in fact, our workplace is intended by God himself to be a place where God meets with us. Our workplace is sacred. One of the things that I found to be helpful in becoming more mindful of that reality is to stop and to take even a short break sometime in my day to become mindful of that. Again, these breaks don't pull me away from my work to do something spiritual over here and then come back and and re-engage with my work, but in fact, remind me that God is already in my work, that my work is sacred and my work is an act, an overflow of my spirituality, that my work life and my faith life actually go together. For a number of months, our staff team have been doing a daily office together. So we've been taking a time of prayer in the middle of our day someone will come around and ring a bell and our staff are invited to come out of their offices and come and do a time of prayer, scripture reading. Some of those are set prayers and some of those are praying for you, for our city, for one another and for the world. And to be honest, I am not the best person at following our daily office. Sharon's smiling because she knows this is true. (laughs) Uh, I'm often one of the last people to enjoy, to engage it. And I often book meetings during my daily office. (laughs) And I want to offer that because even though I find that practice life-giving, it's actually still not easy. I remember actually writing this sermon about taking breaks in our workday, and one of my colleagues came around ringing the bell, and I was writing this section, actually, and I remember thinking, oh, no, it's prayer time. I just really wanted to finish that section and to finish the work that I was doing. And to be honest, even though I'm not the best at it, I actually find those times really meaningful. It's often a little bit of a struggle to pull myself away from my work, possibly because I'm a little bit of a workaholic and I really enjoy what I do. But I really, even more than that, want to seek and find more of God's presence in my workplace. And whether that break is two minutes or 10 minutes, I always come back to my work more engaged, more filled with purpose, and a greater sense of God's presence there. And so if you're seeking to start a new rhythm and you find that hard, a new rhythm of meeting God and a set time of prayer in your workplace, you're not alone. One of the best resources that I found that we've done here at 10th during these times of prayer was a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day. It's uh, my favorite daily devotional book. And if you're starting a new rhythm, maybe in your workplace, let me commend that to you as a resource. This painting that we're about to put up here is a painting by Jean-Francois Millet. It's a painting called The Angelus. And the painting shows two workers working in a field. It's a little bit dark. This is the best painting that I could find. Um, Two workers in the front working in a field. And they're invited to stop for midday prayer by the ringing of the church bell. And you can see the church in the background there. And this was an opportunity for these workers to stop for midday prayer to remember that all of their work is sacred. That all of their work is an offering to God. And whether we are invited to stop through a church bell or an iPhone, we are invited to stop and to remember that our work is sacred. Our work is meaningful. It's a place where we reflect God's character into the world, and it's a place where we meet God. Our work is a kind of prayer. Our work is also a prayer in the sense that it's an offering to God. Even if we don't stop in the middle of our day to stop and engage in a separate time of prayer, maybe you're a healthcare provider and you're with patients all day and you don't know when your breaks will come, Maybe you're a lawyer and you may be in litigation all day and you don't know when your breaks will come. Whatever it is, or you're a parent and you have no idea when your breaks are going to come. If that is you, then your work itself is a prayer. Whether you stop to do a dedicated time of prayer or not, the hands-on, mind-on work that you do is itself an offering 
of prayer. If you're a parent, the ways that you raise your children, the care and attention, the quality to which you bring to that is an offering to God. If you're an accountant, the way you seek to bring truth through the numbers is an offering to God. If you work with patients, clients, or teams, the way you care for them is an offering to God. The quality to which and the heart to which you bring your work is a kind of prayer. We don't need to just be worship, musical worship pastors like Mark to have our work be worship. All of our work, paid or unpaid, in an office or at home, all of our work is a prayer. It's an offering, a dedication, a devotion, an outpouring of our relationship with God back to him. Our work is a prayer. Let me close with this story. As I mentioned, I work with Rick as a custodian at Regent. And my primary roles involved vacuuming the carpets throughout the university, including their massive library, dusting and cleaning a lot of their bookshelves, which, as Sharon knows, there's a lot of books on those bookshelves to work around, and also cleaning the washrooms throughout the university, throughout the college. And it was actually work that, especially in the mornings, I enjoyed because it didn't involve a lot of mental energy. And so often in the morning, I would come in and throw on a podcast or a lecture, but especially engage in times of set prayer. So I'd use that extra mental, mental energy space to spend time in prayer with God. And as I did over those weeks and months, I began to see that not only the conversations internally that I was having with God were a kind of prayer, but in fact, the hands-on work that I did every day was a kind of prayer. That when I brought my very best to vacuuming the carpets, to cleaning the bookshelves and cleaning the toilets, that all of that was an offering to God. And in fact, I didn't actually ever tell anybody this, but I had an internal goal to have the cleanest toilets in all of Vancouver. <laughs> and the reason was I knew that it would benefit everyone who used the facilities, improve their health and, their enjoy, and, the, and how they enjoyed them. But I also knew that if I could clean a toilet to the best of my ability, I could do anything as an offering to God. What are some of the worst parts in your job that feel like cleaning toilets? That's an offering to God. All of your work, big or small, is an offering to God. And the quality to which we bring to it, the heart to which we seek to give to our work, is itself a prayer, an offering of the fullness of ourselves to the fullness of the one who created us. God created our hands. God created our hearts. He gave us our times and our work. And our work is a kind of prayer back to God. It reflects God's character. It's a space where we meet with him. And the quality in the heart to which we bring our work is an act of worship, adoration, and reflection of our love for him. Some of you have heard the name Brother Lawrence, who, was, uh, who lived in a monastery in the 17th century in France. And Brother Lawrence had the modest, most humble jobs in the monastery. He worked as a cobbler fixing sandals. He washed dishes and he cooked meals for the monastery. And even though he had the humblest positions in the monastery, kings and popes came to visit with him personally. Because Brother Lawrence saw all of his work life, whether he was fixing a sandal or washing a dish, as an opportunity to practice God's presence. And his book, Practicing the Presence of God, has been one of the most impactful books in my life, and I commend that to you. It's a series of letters and reflections from his own life, which have been collected together in a book. And on your way out, if you like, uh, I'm gonna, in a moment, read a prayer by Brother Lawrence, and we've created an oversized bookmark with that prayer and a, a picture of Brother Lawrence washing some dishes. And if you want, our connections team will be handing those out on the way out. And this is a, something you can put up in your workplace, at home, on your fridge, or even keep in the car as a way of remembering that all of your work is a prayer. It's a place where we communicate God's character, a place where we meet with God and our work itself, the quality and heart to which we bring to it 
is an overflow of ourselves to God. I invite you now to join me in this prayer written by Brother Lawrence. My God, you are always close to me. In obedience to you, I must now apply myself to outward things. Yet as I do, I pray that you will give me the grace of your presence. To this end, I ask that you will assist my work, receive its fruits as an offering to you, and all the while direct all of my affections to you. Amen. Amen.